where it went. Okay, see my screen? All right, so I don't have to repeat some of this stuff because Chelsea already went, went into it, but the Podam Hill Fault is what it became known as. It's a north dipping back for us to the Seattle Fault Zone. So the Seattle Fault Zone actually dips to the south. And it's north vergent. You can see that in the cross section down here on the bottom. Uh, so where the Toe Jam Hill Falls, what we're working on is actually a back thrust to the, to the main thrust. Um, so the, the, the earthquake history on this fault um, kind of is a proxy for the recurrence of earthquakes along the Seattle, Seattle Fault Zone. But as I'll show, um, it, it, it doesn't represent the entire record. But um, the data that we generate from the mapping and from the trenching that I'll show some pictures of, um, you know, produces data, uh, fault rupture parameter data that's using seismic hazard assessment. And in particular, um, like the timing of the last earthquake, when the most recent one was, uh, the recurrence, um, um, slip rates, all these things inform seismic hazard assessment and are used for probabilistic ground motion um, estimates, estimating maximum magnitude, and also the approach um, to probabilistic fault displacement stuff. Like, um, that he was talking last week, um, you know, mainly the return. Um, so I don't know if to talk about this because we already looked at this, but and then this is some of the first LIDAR that ever came out that was applied to neotopic atomic sort of work um, here uh, on Dane's Island. This is about 1998, and now it's just pretty widely available. Um, in a lot of places and really um, helps us with our work. So I put this on here just to remind myself to tell you that, you know, the GIR stuff is kind of how we're trying to do it now. And it's really sort of cutting edge, putting our confidence on these features, um, tagging features all through the, the area. But um, it's not new. We didn't really have the sort of uh, the terminology and stuff nailed down quite so well back then. But this is just an example of what we produce in the field, and this is just zoomed in on it. And basically, it's just printing out the LIDAR and putting a piece of tracing paper on it and just starting to mark out features that we saw, like little streams, little subtle deflections and offsets in the streams, um, places where there's captures. Um, and this is sort of a mess. You know, this is basically a, uh, a restaurant napkin kind of version, but it's you know, done on tracing paper over LIDAR. But, um, you know, faults were mapped. Um, some of the faults. Secondary features like little liniments to the south of the main fault were also picked out. Uh, little drainages and, and landslide head start and all these sort of features that we've been talking about in class. Um, we went through and sort of made this map to try to find, help us find locations to um, get the best record to trench across the fault. So this is the USGS map from a, um, from a, 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 a field data report from USGS. We haven't really done profiles yet in QGIS, but here's a bunch of profiles along the top that cut across the, uh, that are uh, extracted from the LIDAR across the, the fault. So we kind of get an idea where the scarps are big, where they're small. Um, we talked about this sort of north-south sort of uh, pattern of erosion, which is really just like drumlin features and the ice was moving to the south across the Seattle basin. Um, and then there's, you know, nice scarps that we talked about earlier in class cutting across here. Uh, but there's also little areas where there's uh, low-lying areas where you have increased, um, we have more sedimentation. So on the tops of the drumlins, you maybe have scrapes, bedrock by the ice and just some residual soil. Whereas in the, in the valleys in between, you may have some continual stream deposition. So we kind of look for areas where we might have more sediment to um, record more earthquakes. So I'll just show a couple quick uh, examples. I don't have much time, but here's some of the uh, some of the logs of the um, exposures that we identified. Um, last week I talked about bending in the in the hanging wall of the of the fault and called Robbins. I showed that on the Castle Mountain Fault um, in Alaska. So here's in the bottom. Here's a, a, like a there's some folding. Um, and uh, maybe the main thrust didn't quite get to the surface, but there's this bending in the hanging wall, creating this, this robin uh, or a little fissure where we got a thousand year old date on a, a, a pine needle at the bottom of the fissure, fissure down here. Um, and then this one up here shows the soil um, being thrust over here. So here's just a couple 
uh, pictures. This is a young me. I was able to do this as a volunteer uh, working for the USPS when I was first um, starting this kind of work. So keep your eyes out for volunteer opportunities. It's a really great way to learn a lot. But here's that that uh, fissure I was talking about uh, in the hanging wall, and then the overcrust soil, this brown soil is wrapped in and around the tips of fresh blade. Couple more trenches. Uh, this one was pretty amazing, actually. This is a forest A horizon that was completely crushed over by, by bedrock here. Um, and this one is just some more folding, where we actually had to do some coring in the base of the trench because there was water in there to correlate some of the units to figure out the amount of, of folding that occurred. Uh, these two trenches are located here and here, just along this main scarp. And so here's that forest soil. Kind of hard to see in the light, but it's this dark brown that goes way back here in the trench wall. And then the beige color here is, is sandstones and mudstones, Eocene bedrock that's thrust out over the top of the soil. And it's actually like a log that was pancaked by the bedrock where it collapsed onto it. We were able to get radiocarbon dates off that to fix that again. Um, and then the final one is Crane Lake. This is a really big trench. This is the bedrock here in the beige and sort of some uh, pro-glacial drift, semi-stratified glacial drift, and um, some sand and silt. Um, bedrock, again, um, thrust out over the top of these sediments. Can't tell much here, but the, the beige is the bedrock, and the pro-glacial sediment is just kind of pinkish color here. Um, and from this exposure, we were able to get the longest record. I just put the black and white version in there because it's kind of easier to see in the color version where there's these dark patches of of soils um, and, and different soils, the horizon, different horizons of the soil, um, and some overthrusting happening there. And from that, it was sort of um, it was the longest record, um, three or possibly four earthquakes between 2,500 and 1,000 years ago. Um, the most recent, about 8,900. Um, and this is just a sort of the progression from bottom left to right here. So the upper left to the upper right of just these different events and how it was reconstructed. Um, so it's cool that we get the record of the earthquake on the Toe Jam Hill fault, but it's not the whole story. So as Chelsea started to talk about, there's shore platforms all along the um, Seattle Basin and all along these islands. So here's these red lines are just sort of marine terraces along the southern part of Bainbridge Island. So here's where we, we were working right up in here along the Toe Jam Hill Fault. But there's these shorelines and uplifted platforms all over the place. And the LIDAR is also really helpful at, at um, finding those. So here's just a cross section again to remind you that the, um, it's a north verging uh, reverse fault, the Seattle Fault, and the Toe Jam Hill Fault the back thrust to it. And so sometimes uh, the back thrust has independent earthquakes by itself. And sometimes um, the reverse fault goes uh, and has a more regional uplift pattern. And, um, the Toe Jam Hill might not go. So here's sort of a little diagram and the three earthquakes identified in the Nelson et al. study, and then sort of some other regional uplift features that may not correlate exactly with those events. So when you look at the LIDAR, this is just uh, the yellow is a marine platform. Chelsea is just showing this one here uh, in, the, in the bay here. But on the, on the western side of Bainbridge Island, there's this orange is an older one, there's an older marine platform. And it's only preserved uplifted on the north side of the fault, whereas the yellow marine platform is preserved on both sides of the Tozam Hill Fault. So there's two cross sections, the older one nine meters above mean sea level. Uh, and then the cross section up here is just showing is, is south of the fault and only has one with no preserved upper terrace. So it just shows that there's sometimes um, Uplift is just happening along the Kojam Hill Fault, and sometimes it's happening um, regionally. So here's a little diagram with some of the um, events from the trenches, and then some of the events from from uh, regional uplift. And so they don't always correlate. Sometimes they go together, and sometimes they don't. So it's a big puzzle, and the lidar has really helped us sort of figure out part of that puzzle, um, and it's it's ongoing. So here's a Here's just a picture of us working in the trench. You can see the trees and how difficult it is to work in the, um, in the you know, this, this forest. The LIDAR has really helped us figure things out. And then I don't really have time 
to go through this, but it'll be in, online when I post this lecture. This last diagram, it's really hard to see what's going on there, but it's really pretty cool. You can consider um, a marine platform at the top uh, where regional uplift preserves it. Um, and then all the different combinations of regional uplift versus offset across a single fault, um, you know, and how you can do it. So like down here, two earthquakes, one regional uplift first, local fault offset second, so you can preserve a platform and then cut it with the fault. So we have this pattern of going back and forth between the regional uplift events, uh, North Virgin Trust on the Seattle Fault, and then local uplift events on um, South Virgin, North Dipping, back thrust, the Sojam Hill Fault. So the seismic hazard is complicated, but there's, um, you know, we're getting closer to understanding when and the recurrence between these different types of earthquakes. And so that's all I have. I just wanted to give a little context to the Sojam Hill Fault. I know I'm pretty much out of class time, but happy to take any questions. Thank you, Rich. We do have one minute left, so we could take any questions on Rich's presentation, or also if you have specific questions on the mapping assignment, then that's fine too. What's the distinction between um, like a distinct primary fault versus a strong primary fault in terms of the GIR? Sorry, a, a distinct and strong primary fault. Uh, so a strong has a higher ranking than a distinct. Um, and right now it's, you know, well, we'll be up to you to uh, determine if a fault that you see should be mapped as distinct or uh, strong. But you would generally expect more or higher quality geomorphic indicators for the strong relative to distinct faults. And we'll go over uh, some more specific examples later to help you know, like, like associate more of a geologic or geomorphic picture with the distinctions. So it's more qualitative than quantitative. It's not like a, a number from the GIR score. No, uh, like longer term, we might well turn it your mapping into quantitative scoring, but right now uh, we want the distinction to be based on your interpretation as the geologic mapper. Um, but we will ask for uh, in like, some text justification for your choice. Yes, yeah, so it's back to uh, we are doing research in this class. We're developing this method further. And so exactly how we make that choice uh, will on the quantitative part will come later. And the homework uh, Mara will be released later today. We were hoping to get a little bit of intro to the strike slip before we gave you the strike slip homework, but we can release it um, before the strike slip lecture too. So you guys can at least get some eyes on it and ask any questions. And it'll be, we'll discuss it next class though. So don't feel too much pressure to start it. Um, and then you'll have at least a week to do it. And then um, Elaine, in the next project, we're switching from morphologic mapping to geologic mapping. So you won't have to have um, a style file for anymore. So just the ones that you guys had been using up to that point are fine. And if you choose to continue to add morphologic mapping in your assignments, you can do that, but we won't need to have a style file because we'll be kind of shifting gears a bit to geologic mapping. And I also found um, a way to add the labels to the GIR features too. So I can 
um, make an email or something to send out to you guys later so you can apply that to your shape files. Yes, and put it online too, Rachel, mm -hmm. so it's easy to find. All right, so we're three minutes past the class. Happy to stay. Um, Thanks, everybody. More questions. Um, Chelsea, do you record this to the cloud or to your computer? Um, to my computer. Okay. 